Walking with Dinosaurs is, as I've said before, an incredibly inspiring series that has undoubtedly developed my love for prehistoric life, and it's been very fun to look back at all these episodes to see how they live up to today's science, more than 20 years after the show originally aired. So let's continue to examine the accuracies and inaccuracies of Walking with Dinosaurs. This time it's Cruel Sea, an episode with some particularly controversial decisions and one that focuses more on the non-dinosaur Mesozoic icons, the Ichthyosaurs and Plesiosaurs. This episode is one of my personal favourites, not that there are any that I don't enjoy, so I'm especially looking forward to seeing what was right or wrong about this instalment of Walking with Dinosaurs. We'll start with the main star of the episode, the Ichthyosaur of Thalmasaurus. Like many of the creatures in the first episode, Ophthalmosaurus is unfortunately in the wrong time period for when this episode is set. Fossils of this animal are so far only known from 165 to 160 million years ago, however Cruel Sea clearly states that it is set 149 million years ago. So Ophthalmosaurus was sadly long dead by the time this episode takes place during the late Jurassic. The good news is that it is inhabiting the correct region, as Cruel Sea is based in prehistoric Europe, and indeed fossils of Ophthalmosaurus have been uncovered in European countries. In addition, certain ichthyosaurs found in locations in Russia and the Americas have been proposed to belong to Ophthalmosaurus in the past, though this has also been disputed. But apart from the apparent time-travelling capabilities that the show gave to this ichthyosaur, there's actually a lot that they got right with Ophthalmosaurus. The overall body shape of the animal is really quite good, largely thanks to the fact that a lot of fossils preserving incredible detail of the soft tissue outlines have been discovered, so we have a pretty good understanding of what ichthyosaurs in general looked like. These fossils show that the animals had very streamlined bodies, with soft tissue dorsal fins and crescent shaped tails. The Walking with Dinosaurs design incorporates all of this, as well as the remarkably large eyes which make Ophthalmosaurus so famous. The huge eyes have been suggested by paleontologists to potentially have a use in enabling Ophthalmosaurus to hunt in deep water or at night, and these ideas are reflected in the episode when several individuals are shown hunting squid in the dark. I especially like the detail of the Tapetum lucidum being visible in the close-ups of the animatronics. This is the layer of reflective tissue behind the retinas of many organisms which helps animals to see better in low-light conditions. So, while clearly this is speculative for ichthyosaurs, it's a reasonable assumption that these creatures could have possessed such structures. Something that was once regarded as an inaccuracy in the Ophthalmosaurus design concerns the close-up shots in which rows of small teeth are visible in the jaws of the animals. According to the accompanying book, Walking with Dinosaurs The Evidence, it was long thought that adult Ophthalmosaurus lacked any teeth in their jaws, and so some people may have considered this inclusion as an error. However, the book states that examinations of adult individuals have in fact revealed that mature Ophthalmosaurus really did possess some small teeth. It's possible that the near toothless jaws of these ichthyosaurs were therefore suited to catching squid, just like as shown in the episode. Strangely though, the narration states that they have long toothless snouts, so I'm not entirely sure what was going on there, perhaps there was a small mix-up. But the model at least does appear to be accurate in terms of teeth. Another feature which has become a debated topic in more recent years is the coloration of these animals. The colours given to the Walking with Dinosaurs of Thalmasaurus are, I would say, fairly reasonable, with clear countershading present and being reminiscent of certain modern cetaceans, but while also not being distractingly based on any single living animal. The countershading, that is, the darker top colours and lighter bottom colours, seems to also be divided by patternings that are aiding in the crypsis, which is a nice detail that also seems plausible. Crypsis is the primary use of countershading anyway, making it more difficult for potential predators or prey to spot the organisms from above or below. So in all, at first glance it seems the coloration of the Ophthalmosaurus is pretty good. But there was a study published in 2014 which has resulted in some considering the idea of countershaded ichthyosaurs to be outdated. This study involved detecting direct chemical evidence of pigmentation being present in the fossilised skin of a mosasaur, a leatherback turtle, and an ichthyosaur. The study further states that, unlike many modern marine animals living out in open water, it seemed that at least some ichthyosaurs were completely dark coloured, with no countershading present. So this has led to some criticisms of the Walking with Dinosaurs ichthyosaurs, with people now saying that they should be totally dark all over. But, a much more recent study from 2018 which analysed an exceptionally preserved specimen of Stenopterygius was able to recover traces of the skin of the animal, leading to some very interesting results. Not only did this study confirm that ichthyosaurs had blubber beneath their scaleless skin, but it also described how variations in certain pigment cells across the body supported the presence of countershading. So there is still evidence for this sort of coloration. 
Personally, I still think the Walking with Dinosaurs colours are reasonable, and undoubtedly it looks very nice, and again creates another iconic look for the species. Plus, it's interesting to think that if ichthyosaurs were anything like modern day cetaceans such as dolphins, they could probably have had all sorts of variable colour schemes between different species that are all pretty distinct from one another. So who knows, perhaps some ichthyosaurs were all dark in colour, while others had counter shading. A significant part of the ophthalmosaur story in this episode focuses on their reproduction, and it's shown that hundreds of females all migrate from deeper ocean to shallower seas in order to give birth. I've seen this speculative bit of behaviour being criticised, however the accompanying Walking with Dinosaurs The Evidence book suggests that there is indeed some data which could support this speculation. This is the fact that at a few certain localities in Germany, the fossilised remains of many different female ichthyosaurs with embryos still inside them or with the young sticking out of their cloacas have been found. Due to this concentration of so many female individuals with babies, it's not unreasonable to think that they may have been moving as a group to certain locations and shallower waters where they could give birth like is shown in the episode. The baby ophthalmosaurs being born tail first is also directly supported by evidence in the fossil record, which shows that, like modern cetaceans, ichthyosaurs gave birth this way. Although, the actual fossil remains which show the babies halfway out of their mothers are probably like this due to them being pushed out after the adult died by the gases building up inside the carcass, but they were still orientated tail first and would have come out that way if they had survived. So, overall the ophthalmosaurus design and displayed behaviours are pretty good, and apart from being in the wrong time, this is probably one of the most accurate depictions in the whole series as far as our current understanding goes, though of course there is still a good deal of speculation involved. Unfortunately, the other creatures in the episode are not so faithful to reality. Let's look now at the Lyplorodon. So, obviously the main issue with the Walking with Dinosaurs interpretation of Lyplorodon is that it is massively oversized. Magical Leoplerodon! Stated in the episode to be 25 metres in length and weighing 150 tonnes, this assertion understandably caused quite a bit of controversy. It's now accepted amongst paleontologists that Lyplorodon in fact would normally have grown to between about 5 and 7 metres in length, with some exceptionally large individuals possibly growing to perhaps a little over 10 metres nowhere close to the enormous 25 metres of the big male in Cruel Sea. Essentially what happened to result in this huge figure was that some very fragmentary remains from the Oxford clay were sighted, which may or may not be from Lyplorodon, and which appear to belong to a potentially very large animal estimated at about 20 metres in length, though even this estimate has been disputed. So the argument was therefore made that it's very unlikely for this supposedly 20 metre long pliosaur to represent the largest individual of its entire species, and so even larger individuals could in theory have existed, leading to an extra 5 metres getting added. But clearly this massive size no longer seems very plausible at all, due to the dubious estimates based on very incomplete fossils, and instead the more complete remains we have of Lyplorodon show that this plesiosaur would have been a much, much smaller creature than the titan shown in the episode. The figure of 150 tonnes is pretty ridiculous too, as this was based on estimates of comparably sized whales. However, most of the weight in cetaceans is a result of their thick blubber, and since Lyplorodon was living in warm seas it would not have possessed blubber like this, so as a result would have weighed far less even if it did get to the size of a blue whale. At the body length the species is now thought to reach, Lyplorodon has been estimated to fall in the range of about 1 to 3 tonnes instead. In addition, not only is this creature grossly oversized, but like Ophthalmosaurus it's apparently a time traveller too, as Lyplorodon is only known from 166 to 155 million years ago, while the episode is based 149 million years ago. But apart from the scale, the overall model of the Lyplorodon is not really all that bad. It's possibly a little shrink-wrapped, but it's not very noticeable, and the countershading and general coloration is very nice, seemingly again inspired by modern cetaceans, this time more obviously based on orcas, but it's still different enough to remain unique, and since the episode aired it's become a pretty iconic look for this organism. A development in the research of the life appearance of plesiosaurs in general that occurred long after Walking with Dinosaurs came out concerns the tails of these reptiles, with it now seeming very likely that many, if not all, plesiosaurs actually possessed a tail fluke. Studies of the tail bones have found evidence that a fleshy fluke was present here, and there's potentially some historical evidence of soft tissue traces of such structures, though that line of evidence has been unfortunately complicated. So we now know that Lyplorodon would in all likelihood have had a fluke, and not the cylindrical tail shape shown in the episode. Plesiosaurs are well known for having a unique style of locomotion amongst tetrapods, with fore and hind flippers that are roughly the same size and shape as one another, suggesting that the animals were utilising all four of their limbs to propel themselves. This is in contrast to examples such as sea turtles, which only use their forelimbs as the main source of propulsion. 
Several different hypotheses for how exactly plesiosaurs used their flippers have been proposed over the years, with the earliest ideas suggesting they would row themselves, but this is actually pretty inefficient and was soon discarded. The currently most favoured idea, a variation of which is used in walking with dinosaurs, is a method in which all four of the limbs move up and down, with powerful downstrokes providing lift to propel the animals forwards. This method is supported by large muscle attachment sites on the undersides of plesiosaurs, however it still can't be said for certain whether the fore and hind limbs moved in synchrony or in an alternating fashion. A study from 2017 which used reconstructed plesiosaur flippers in a water tank found that by altering the timing between flaps of the limb pairs, these animals have a great deal of control over their thrust and the efficiency of their movements. So these reptiles were potentially alternating the exact flipper movements a lot depending on how fast they wanted to go. All this is to say that the locomotion method shown in the episode is plausible and there's evidence to support it, but there's no way to really know for certain how these animals were moving their limbs relative to each other at a specific moment without observing a living individual. The comparison with orcas doesn't just stop at the colour scheme either, as the behaviour displayed at the very start of the episode, in which the pliosaur launches itself out of the water to catch a Eustreptor spondylus, was actually based on observations of orcas beaching themselves to catch seals and drag them back into the water, though it does seem unlikely that at the size the Lyplorodon is meant to be in this episode it was able to get into such shallow waters, and of course when orcas are catching the seals they're on sandy beaches and not rocky spits. Next, how did this episode do with its portrayal of the dinosaur Eustreptor spondylus? Well, yet again it's actually in the wrong time period for this episode, as the theropod is dated to about 162 million years ago, not 149. The overall look of this dinosaur is pretty odd as well, and it's clear that it's essentially a reused Allosaurus model from the previous episode. While it's understandable that they did this, saving time and money and therefore meaning more prehistoric creatures could be included in the series overall, it's also kind of sad that this unique British dinosaur didn't really get a fair representation. Eustreptor spondylus is a member of the Megalosaurids, and wouldn't have looked like an Allosaurus very much at all. The head shape should be different, and fortunately the holotype specimen actually preserves the skull, so we have a good idea of what this would have appeared like. Essentially Eustreptor spondylus had a much longer, narrower snout than what is shown in the episode, and there were no crests above its eyes. Additionally, there was a slight downturning of the jaw tip. Then there's also the same issues present with many of the other dinosaur reconstructions in the series, such as a bit too much shrink wrapping and the hands being pronated. Feathering in this taxon would be highly speculative, though a potential possibility, but like with other certain species featured in the show it's understandable that no feathery filaments were included on this design. The Eustreptor spondylus individuals in this episode display some curious behaviour, such as swimming between islands and scavenging, as well as actively hunting along beaches. The ability of this dinosaur to swim is not too difficult to believe, and as it's said in the evidence book, many animals alive today which don't necessarily seem as though they'd be able to swim, such as elephants or ostriches, which have a similar body plan to the extinct theropod, are in fact very able swimmers that can make their way across large areas of open water. Plus, there's actually trace fossil evidence suggesting that theropods would sometimes swim, from sites in the US and Spain. Eustreptor spondylus was reconstructed as a beach-going animal primarily due to the fact that the holotype specimen of this dinosaur was discovered in marine deposits, and there were even fossilised oysters stuck onto its bones. This could mean that it died inland and was then washed out to sea by a river, or perhaps it did die on a beach and get washed out that way. So, while not necessarily solid evidence that this dinosaur spent its entire life swimming between islands and scavenging along their beaches, it's a fairly reasonable speculative lifestyle that doesn't contradict the fossil evidence we have. The original most complete specimen of Eustreptor spondylus is estimated at 4.6 metres long, and in Walking with Dinosaurs it's reconstructed at about the same size, with a narration giving it at 5 metres long. It's apparently been claimed before that this relatively small size for a theropod is due to Eustreptor spondylus being an example of insular dwarfism. However, the small size is actually due to the holotype still not being fully grown, and these creatures could have gotten a bit larger. So, although it's not claimed to be an example of insular dwarfism in the episode, a fully grown Eustreptor spondylus would have been bigger than the creatures shown here. Moving back to the marine reptiles now, Cryptoclidus is another plesiosaur that makes an appearance in this episode. The overall look of this animal is, like the other marine creatures, generally not too bad. The head is perhaps slightly the wrong shape, and there's the same issue with the tail fluke most likely being present, but apart from that the design is pretty solid. The coloration seems to be based more on pinnipeds this time and not cetaceans, which is not unreasonable, and also reflects the very seal-like lifestyle shown for this organism in the episode, which is more unreasonable, but we'll get into that soon. 
There also doesn't appear to be any unnecessary shrink wrapping, and the same plausible locomotion method that we discussed earlier for the Lyplorodon is also used by the Cryptoclidus. So yeah, it's a decent model. The main problem with the Cryptoclidus in this episode is that they are shown resting on land like seals, before leaping into the water. I'm not sure where this idea came from, but it seems the only argument for this being a possibility is the very strong musculature of the limbs present on the underside of plesiosaurs, as well as the fact that pinnipeds heavier than Cryptoclidus can move about on land. However, the anatomy of these marine reptiles does not support any possibility of terrestrial capabilities, with limb girdles that don't connect to the spine, and an inability to properly process light or sound in the medium of air, as indicated by the morphology of their sclerotic ossicles and ear bones. Plesiosaurs such as Cryptoclidus were entirely adapted for life in the water, and would have been pretty much stranded if they were to find themselves on land, nothing like the creatures shown in Cruel Sea which gracefully dive into the ocean. There is also a species of pterosaur shown in this episode, Rampharynchus. This reptile is, amazingly, actually in the correct time period, being known from remains dating to between 150.8 and 148.5 million years ago. The design of this animal unfortunately suffers from many of the general pterosaur inaccuracies that we've discussed in previous episodes. Wing tips that are too pointy, wings folding in from the sides instead of from behind, and a lack of pycnofibers covering the body. The necks of these pterosaurs also seem to be a bit too long and thin as well, though the wings themselves could do with being longer, as Rampharynchus possessed exceptionally elongated wings. The iconic tail veins of Rampharynchus are nicely reconstructed, however the jaw tips are a bit weird. The pterosaurs do indeed have toothless jaw tips that became fairly curved as they grew older, we know this thanks to fossils of variously aged Rampharynchus individuals, and there were soft tissue extensions to the ends of the jaws, but they look as though they're keratinized almost nail-like structures in the Walking with Dinosaurs models, while the rest of the jaws are covered in skin. In reality the extensions would probably have looked a little more subtle, though the curving upwards of the jaws and the many small outward pointing teeth are reconstructed pretty well. The behaviours displayed by the pterosaurs in this episode have also been brought into question, as Rampharynchus is here reconstructed as a skim feeder. This is an idea about the lifestyle of Rampharynchus that has actually been around since the early 1900s, when this taxon was the first pterosaur to be suggested to have skim fed. Studies from later in the 20th century also supported this hypothesis, comparing the compressed lower jaw of Rampharynchus to the lower jaws of the modern day skimmer birds. But there are still a great deal of features that are unlike skimmer jaws, such as Rampharynchus jaws not being as thin as them, the lower jaws not being longer than the upper jaws like in skimmers, as well as the pterosaurs not seeming to possess any of the attachment sites for the powerful muscles necessary to perform the skimming behaviour. More recent studies have not found good support for a skimming lifestyle in pterosaurs such as Rampharynchus either, revealing that although they could have been energetically capable of skim feeding, there is no anatomical evidence to suggest that they did. So, it's very improbable that these small pterosaurs would ever have been seen skimming across the water's surface like is shown here. Finally, there's also an ancient shark that features briefly in Cruel Sea. Although it's not named as such in the actual episode, it's been confirmed that this is Hybodus. There isn't much to say about this creature's depiction in the show other than it's pretty close to how we still think this shark would have looked like when it was alive, due to the fact that its cartilage skeleton seems to have been highly ossified, making it much stronger than the cartilage of other sharks and meaning more fossils preserving the entire bodies of these animals have been discovered, so we have a good idea of what this genus looked like. Hybodus is a remarkable taxon for surviving throughout most of the Mesozoic era, from the Permian through to the Cretaceous and one of the most distinguishing characteristics are the dorsal spines, which are nicely reconstructed in the models for the episode. The sharks are shown to wait around the ophthalmosaurus mother as she gives birth, and then scavenge on her carcass, and later as hunting one of the pups, as well as pursuing the injured Lyplorodon. All quite plausible behaviour for these carnivores. So we've looked at the prehistoric animals that feature in this episode, but what about the environments they're shown to be living in? The episode is supposedly set in the Oxford clay, though the given date of 149 million years ago is a bit off, and this rock formation is indeed a shallow marine shelf deposit. There's not a lot that can be said about the underwater environments, there would probably have been areas that look similar to this in the shallower regions near to the many islands making up Europe at this time, and it's a suitable setting especially if female ichthyosaurs were really migrating together into shallow waters to give birth. The placements of islands over the shallow sea of Britain have been inferred by geologists, and so all the very small islands featured in the episode seem to be fairly reasonable assumptions of what a hypothetical archipelago could have looked like. As for the overall story element of this episode, I think it's certainly one of the most compelling in the series, again mainly following baby individuals in their struggle to survive, like in the last episode, a good way to get the audience invested in the world. It's also very nice to have an episode dedicated to the often left out marine reptiles of the Mesozoic, 
After all, they were a huge part of the ecosystems throughout this period of time, and it was great to focus on these remarkable animals as well and not just have every episode entirely about dinosaurs. The opening scene of this episode, while it does have some issues if you think about it too much, is probably the best opening to any of the episodes, at least it's my favourite anyway. The way our expectations are subverted, describing the scene as if the Eustreptospondylus is the top predator about to catch some sort of marine organism, and then revealing the enormous Lyplerodon as it closes its jaws around the dinosaur is quite brilliant, excellently setting up the real stars of the episode and showing the audience that the marine reptiles alive at this time were just as fearsome and fascinating as the terrestrial fauna. There are a lot of parallels to the first episode too, with the top predator of the region having to face off against another of their kind again, and by the end of the episode ending up dead and prey to the smaller dinosaurs, just like the Postosuchus. That's not a complaint though, as it's a pretty good format and serves to show that even the supposedly strongest, most formidable predators will always end up as food for something else in nature. Anyway, there are as many of the accuracies and inaccuracies that I could find within this episode, as well as some of my thoughts on it. As always, I have no doubt that I've probably left some things out, so let me know in the comments if you think there's something else I should have included. Next episode will be a very special one, and it's also my personal favourite in the series, though it's far from being free of errors. Giant of the Skies. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.